So I'm driving in this morning uh, to the hotel. I, I, I have a home not too far from here. And as I often do, I'm listening to NPR. And I'm thinking, I have to give a talk on optimism? <laughs> Three stories, just from home to here. Three stories. The first, see, the United States under Trump is shooting itself in the foot with tariffs on Canada. So the Canadians are brilliant. They've decided to shoot themselves in the knee by imposing tariffs on the U.S. And, like, and people love this. They think this is cool and great. That's story number one. Story number two. There is a homeless crisis in L.A. There are massive numbers of homeless. And nobody can understand why. No. Listen to this, right? Why are there so many homeless people in L.A.? Because the city of L.A. is constantly building homes for the homeless. So they're taking them from the street and putting them in the home. And then they turn around and there are more people in the street. They never heard about this thing. They offer something for free. Everybody's going to come. I mean, people are abandoning their rent to become homeless because they're going to get a free home afterwards. I mean, the insanity of the world we live in. But the third story was the best. It turns out, and this is all true. I mean, this is what I heard on the radio coming in today. The city of Seattle. Yeah, that's enough, right? <laughs> The city of Seattle and many other places around the country are in the process of banning plastic straws because the world is dying from too many plastic straws. We don't know where to put all the plastic straws. When they recycle plastic, it turns out the straws fall in between the machines in the gaps and there are straws everywhere. So they, 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 they think you're paper straws. But what happens when you put paper into water? <laughs> Try that sometime. Or organic straws. And, it, you know, and, it, and they, they, the whole show is with a straight face. Right? I'm laughing in the car, but they're in a straight face. So look, it's easy to be pessimistic. It's easy to see the world as a dark place. And it's easy to believe that the future is even bleaker than the present. If you listen to the news, there's almost nothing encouraging. There's almost nothing positive. If you look at our universities, and I'm not going to go through the whole litany because you know all the negative stuff. So I'm going to focus on the positive, but just on a highlight, right? What are they teaching at the universities today? The garbage, the postmodernism, the nonsense that is being taught in the humanities is just unimaginable. You've got Antifa, you know, stopping speakers from speaking all over the U.S., and now we, we're exporting it to Europe. Right. We've got people advocating for the worst, stupidest ideas ever, young people embracing socialism, believing socialism is the future. We've got professors teaching them that that's a little too moderate. They shouldn't be so idealistic. Nihilism is the real thing of the future. Right? If you look at the field of ideas, it is a disaster. And if you look at the field of politics, it's awful. There's just nobody, and I know some of you are Trump fans, but you're going to have to forgive me. It's a disaster of, of, of unimaginable proportion, in my view. It's, I can't imagine a worse combination than Obama and then Trump. And if you look around the world, you know, you've got Hungary and Poland descending into what looks like authoritarianism. You've got Putin in Russia. And in China, you've got this guy who's now going to be dictator for his whole life. And it just looks like a mess out there. And it's a disaster. And it is. All of that is true. All of it. All of it is true. So how can we be optimistic? And what does it even mean to be optimistic? Well, I take optimism in the context that we're talking about, is to have a positive view of the future, that the future is going to be better, that things are going to be good in our own lives, we'll talk about that, and in the world, generally. So how can you do that? How can you have a positive attitude given everything that we read, everything that we look, everything that we observe out there. 
Well, I think we're not looking. I think we're not actually observing. I think we're way too focused on politics and way too focused on what the news chooses to tell us. We're not introspecting, and we know very little history. Very little history. Because, man, this is the best time in human history to be alive. It's... I mean, in every, by every measure, every material measure, certainly, of human flourishing, of the potential of what we could do as human beings, there has never been a better time to be alive. We're living longer and healthier lives than ever before. I mean, we've got, I don't know, 150 students here. I mean, your life expectancy probably is 100, maybe much more, if the kind of breakthroughs that people are expecting exist are going to, are going to actually happen. Right? We all, our life expectancy, everybody in this room is way above 80. And that's stunning. It was 20 years less, not that long ago. Certainly not if you look at history, 100,000 years, 10,000 years, 5,000 years. Think about how wealthy we are. I mean, you've all seen the graphs, I assume, right? 300 years ago, we were all living on $2 a day or less. $2 in today's dollars. Think about what it looks like to live on $2 a day. Today, it's hundreds of times more than that if you live in the West. And indeed, the number of people living on $2 a day or less today is at the lowest point in human history because it's only gone down. 30 years ago, it was about 30% of humanity was living on $2 a day or less. Today, it's under 9%. And within a couple of decades, if certain trends continue, it'll be zero. Extreme poverty, the way we all lived not that long ago from a historical perspective, is being eradicated, it's being eliminated, it's gone. More people today on the planet are being educated, they can read. I mean, that's amazing. We are brought into the world to trade with billions of new minds. Think what that can do for the future. Billions of people now have access to the internet, have access to computer power, have access to information, to knowledge, to history, to science, to math. They didn't have it before. Billions. Now think of what we've done, just 300 million or 400 million, just with the, the number of geniuses we can produce. But think now on billions and what they can produce and what they can create and what they can make. And we're all interconnected. So we can trade at a far more efficient, far more productive. The transaction costs have gone down to almost zero, particularly in intellectual pursuits and in innovation and in technology. What is possible? is truly amazing. And yes, they're not, they don't have the right philosophy, we'll talk about that, and yes, they're not 100% free, neither are we, but they're free enough to think, they're free enough to sit at a computer and learn. Think about how many people today know math and science around the world. I mean, our educational system has gone like that, but the rest of the world Maybe it's not a great educational system, but they have one. There never used to be an educational system in much of the world. Kids didn't get educated in China, right? Certainly not with anything valuable until very recently. Think about India. Think about the beginning even in Africa. Think about what the access to mobile technology and what the access to the Internet has the potential to do to these continents with billions of people. Who contributed, who contributed to their own lives? Nothing, because they were just subsistence farmers and contributed to us in terms of trade. Nothing, because they weren't part of a global economy. One of the things that really pisses me off more than anything, and this is by way, what, maybe why I have such a visceral response to Trump, is that globalization is one of the most amazing, stunning, beautiful phenomena that I've ever seen. 
the humanity has ever experienced, the ability to trade across continents, the ability to benefit from the genius of somebody on the other side of the world, or the ability to, tra to benefit from some person who's willing to just assemble something so I don't have to assemble it, and my children don't have to assemble it. The ability to benefit from the benefits of trade that we all learn from Ayn Rand, the win-win relationships. But now on a global scale with billions of people instead of just millions of people, is something that has to be celebrated, cheered on, applauded, and instead it's turned into this negative, it's turned into this dark, it's turned into this, you know, somehow it's you against them when it's not. It's trade, it's win-win. So globalization has changed the world for the better, universally. People are better off. We're better off. Standard of living of Americans has gone up dramatically because of trade with China. Dramatically, if you look at the numbers. Particularly if you're middle class and lower middle class and poor. Your lifestyle, standard of living has gone up because we trade with the world. But think about the power of this connected world. Think about the power of the minds. Think about the number of geniuses born when you're now accessing eight billion people rather than just a billion. It's eight times more. And we know the power of genius. We know the power of productive genius and what it can do to our own lives. How can we not be positive about the future when we see so many people engaged in it? I mean, even at this OCON, I don't know, uh, something like 30% of all attendees now are foreigners. Never used to be. We've got a big contingency from Argentina. We've got a big contingency, like last time, I think, from Poland, from vast arrays. And then I see the audience to my show is global. The phenomenon is not global. And that couldn't happen without this amazing technology. And, of course, think about technology, right? My famous iPhone. <laughs> I'm still, still working on getting the, the X. Um, I mean... I've always said this is more powerful than the computer that sent man to the moon. I read that somewhere, and I, that's true, no question. But what somebody told me a few weeks ago is that, and, 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 you know, sending a man to the moon, that was 68. That's a long time ago, and you, you guys weren't even born, and I was a kid, and, you know, so that, that's hard to connect to. But for me to connect, it was somebody said, told me a few, a few weeks ago that this is more powerful than a Cray supercomputer was in the 1980s. And I remember Cray supercomputers. They filled rooms, and it was like, whoa, a cray. I have one in my pocket. <laughs> you have one in my pocket. Pretty much everybody has one in their pocket. I mean, that is stunning. It's amazing. And think about what you get here. And, you, you know, many of you have heard me say this. You, not only do you get all the knowledge of the ages, uh, you know, the poems of the ages, the stories of the ages. You get all the music of the ages. You can look up anything on this thing. Spiritual values, material values, it's, it's, it's right here. You can access it. For what? How much does it cost you? Nothing. How do we measure that increase in standard of living that getting something for free has? We can't. Economists don't know what to do with free stuff. We don't know what to do. We can't measure it. We don't know how to add it up. We can't, right? We can, we can deal with money and, and assets that are priced in terms of money, but free stuff we don't know what to do with. If you look around, you know, in spite of all the bad stuff that's happening, People seem to be going about their business. They're working hard. They're producing values. They're creating stuff. You know, cross. Now, granted, we're in Newport Beach, so one of the nicer and, and wealthier places in the world. But you go across into that mall across the street, and, 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 and wow, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's stunning. And there are places like that all over the country. Now, not to say, again, everybody's life is good. They're no victims of the state. They are. They're huge victims of the philosophical state in which we live. But let's get a perspective in terms of where we are and what we are. Right? 2008, I remember sitting at Fox Business with Peter Schiff next to me, talking about the financial crisis. And Peter was basically saying, I love Peter, but he was basically saying, this is hyperinflation. We are all doomed. Gold is going to 10,000. And this is the end of civilization as we know it. We should all move to China because <laughs> we've decoupled somehow. 
And yeah, it was bad. It was bad. But I don't think a lot of you even remember it. It's gone. We're back to work. Somehow we overcome these challenges. Somehow capitalism, whatever's left of capitalism, whatever freedom we have, we adjust, we adapt. And even these tariffs, as bad as they are, and they're, they're just stupid is what, what really bugs me, is they're adapting, right? What's, what's, what's um, Holly Davidson going to do? They need to sell motorcycles in Europe. They can't sell it from here because there's a 20% tariff. So what are they are going to do? They're going to ship production to Thailand. They're still going to make the motorcycles. They're still going to import them to Europe. Yeah, they'll be more expensive. It's less efficient. It's less productive. It's not as good. But we will survive even Donald Trump. <laughs> Just like we survived Obama. We will survive. So I think all these things, and, and I could go on and on and on, and you, you, you do it in your own head. Think about all the wonderful things. But take an historical perspective. Think about YouTube. Didn't exist 12 years ago. Google didn't exist 20 years ago. Amazon. Who buys on Amazon? I don't need to ask, because I know every single one of you buys something else on Amazon. Right. I mean, wow. It makes my life so much better. It makes every one of your life so much better. It's amazing the kind of life that we get to live in this world. Right. How much did it cost you to come to the conference? Relative to 20 years ago, very little. So life is getting better all the time. Life on this planet in particular, if you take a global, I dare say globalist, if you take a global perspective, life on this planet is getting amazing. As I said, literacy, health, wealth, every parameter of individual flourishing is better on a planetary level. And I know we're all Americans, or most of us are Americans, but hey, again, we've got trading partners over there, and dare I say it, if somebody else, somewhere else becomes better, we could even move. That should be an option for every individual. So, things are good. Things are going well. Why? <laughs> We gotta ask ourselves why. Because ideas drive history, we know that. Philosophy drives the world, that is the objectivist theory of history, and it's true. And yet the ideas in our culture, the ideas taught at our universities, the ideas held by our philosophers, by our historians, by our intellectuals are rotten to the core, for the most part at least. So how is it that things are good and seem to be getting better, and I believe are getting better and will get better, in spite of the fact that all these ideas, which we believe drive history, are so bad. It's because I think we're ignoring the most important ideas that actually are driving our culture. I think we're ignoring what implicitly is actually driving human behavior today. An implicit philosophy, very few people have an explicit philosophy. I want to give you an example. So you go to school, and uh, you're taught all this leftist garbage in school. It's just standard. Every school, every university in the country teaches the same nonsense. Socialism, you might even rally around some socialist flag while you're at university. And then, you know, conservatives say, then you go into the workplace and you get a paycheck and you realize how much taxes you're not paying and you flip. But I don't think that's right. I don't think it's the taxes that makes you flip. When you go to work, have you ever had a boss that said to you, look, reality isn't really real. If you want to have some fictitious customers, that's okay, and we can create, we can invent a product, and it doesn't, we don't have to actually make it, and, you know, and money's evil. I mean, if there's a boss like that, how long would they survive in business? They'd be out very quickly. If they actually, not just said it, but lived it. You can't live it. You can't actually survive the really bad philosophy that is being taught. 
So the Savior, to a large extent, particularly in America, but I think more and more globally, the Savior of these kids who get all this rotten education is that they get a job in business where the boss says, I don't care what you learned in school. That's a customer, that's a product, and we make money here. <laughs> and you learn, they learn, that that's the way the world is. And they learn implicitly that it's kind of fun. So yeah, you have, Tal was telling me about all these leftist programmers in Silicon Valley. Yeah, they can be leftist over lunch. But you can't program if you're a, if you're a postmodernist. There's no, it doesn't mean anything, right? When it comes to programming, you better be reality focused. When it comes to programming, you better use your reason. And when it comes to your paycheck, you're suddenly an individualist. The implicit philosophy, and I think this is a powerful, powerful force. The implicit philosophy embedded in the very nature of business is a powerful force on young people coming into that world. The BS, the co complete garbage is out. Now, it doesn't save them as individuals because they will still feel guilty for making the money. They will still have the altruism bugging them and hounding them and preventing them from truly benefiting, of truly being happy and completely embracing the world in which they live and completely understanding what it is that you're trying to do. That will always be a handicap. They can't do it. But on the other hand, they're not going to be as wacky as their professors would like them to be. They're going to grow up. They're going to produce. They're going to make stuff and build stuff. And, you know, the rest of us will benefit from that. So it's not ideal. And I'm not trying to portray the world that we live in as ideal. I think the biggest loss that we have in the world we live in today, the two really... One is what the world could be. Oh, my God. I don't know how many of you have the imagination to imagine what a laissez-faire capitalist world, just from a material perspective, would be like. I mean, flying cars is nothing, right? It would be astounding the amount of wealth we could actually accumulate, what the technology could actually look like, right? That's one. And the second, worse, I think, is what it does to the soul of individuals. The fact that they, yes, they produce, they create, they build, they make, they do all this stuff, but they don't fully enjoy it. They don't fully make it part of them. It doesn't become a source for their happiness. And that's tragic. That's tragic. So I think we underestimate the role of enlightenment ideas in the world in which we live. The Enlightenment, which I think of in a simplistic, simple way, not simplistic, but simple way, as really two ideas that come out of the Enlightenment. They have the individualism, the idea of the sanctity of the individual. Your life is yours. It doesn't belong to the tribe, the king, anybody. It's yours. And the idea of the efficacy of reason, it's really reason first, individualism next, but the efficacy of reason, and that transmitted primarily through the idea of science and the scientific method. But those two ideas are out there in the culture. Not explicit, not integrated, but they're there. People still love science and respect science. So much so that the environmentalists who are anti-science to the core have to use scientists in order to try to you know, convince us Convince the public that they are somehow right. They can't avoid it. They can't just talk philosophy. They can't just talk about how evil human beings are and how nasty they are. They have to bring science into the picture. We all respect science. We think it's important. And in that sense, we all respect reason. At least, again, to the extent that we do. And think about how many, again, think about this global world. Think about how many people today study in school math and science. Put aside all the other stuff, which is maybe a lot of garbage there, but just math and science. How many people 300 years ago studied math and science? Five, like on the whole planet? 
you know, 500, 5,000. Now you've got billions of people who went to school and gained a certain respect, a certain way of thinking about the world through math and science, which allows for the kind of technological revolution that you experience, the kind of technological advancement that is going on in the world today. Now, billions of people now know these subjects. These are subjects that come out of the Enlightenment. There is no math and science for everybody before that. It, that's something only the Platonic philosopher Kings did. But in the Enlightenment, brought it down to everybody. And now the whole world has embraced this Enlightenment value without even knowing it's an Enlightenment value, without knowing where it came from. So there is a respect for reason. People still, you know, when you talk to them, they're looking for evidence. What's the facts? Our legal system still is oriented towards facts for the most part. Right? And that, again, is spreading across the world. We're seeing more and more and more orientation towards reality, away from kind of mysticism, away from the witch doctors, and more about evidence. And you're seeing that more so maybe in other countries than in the United States, but you're seeing it as a global phenomenon. And it's, wow. And then the second part of this is individualism, and I find this interesting. So I travel all over the world, as you know, and I speak to a lot of audiences around the world. And I can go anywhere. A town in China, uh, you know, in, in Eastern Europe, and my guess is this would be true in Africa, although I have not tried it. You ask an audience in any one of these places, who does your life belong to? And everybody says, me. I mean, they say it as if it's obvious. What do you mean? Who does my life belong to? It belongs to me. Now, if you'd asked that question 35 years ago in China, that would have not been the response. I Suddenly, 20 years ago in Eastern Europe, that would have not been the response. Suddenly, again, without knowing it, without holding the idea of individualism and with all its implications of what it means philosophically and what it means for the world, there are all these people that at least at some level see their value as an individual. My life does not belong to the party. My life does not belong to the state. My life does not belong to the proletarian or to the race or to any of these things. My life belongs to me. And again, all these people are waking up, billions of people all over the world, to this idea that their life is theirs to live. And that's, wow, that is, that is powerful. And Americans still believe their life is theirs to live. And yes, they're not consistent. They're horribly inconsistent about it. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the way they live their life, they're using reason and rationality and their work, and they care about what happens to them and their family and their kids, and that's their center of focus. And the altruism, which is, ugh, altru there's nothing worse than the, the way altruism affects a human soul. The altruism prevents them from being proud of that, prevents them from benefiting from that, but they do it, and they benefit from it indirectly, right, materially in other ways. And we all benefit from that fact, that there are civilized people out there. You know, one of the trends I forgot to say, forgot to tell you about is violence is the lowest level of violence in all of human history today. There are fewer crimes, there's fewer, there are fewer wars, right? We obsess about the one or two wars that exist out there. But there's never been a more peaceful time, never been a more peaceful time in all of human history. And Ayn Rand said, why, right? Why is there few wars? Because when people value their own life, when people use their mind, you know, they don't go out and jump on grenades and start wars for the sake of killing each other. They want to trade. Again, one of the reasons I'm so offended by tariffs and the language of anti-trade is that trade is one of the great pacifying forces in the world. When it's driven by self-interest and win-win transactions, So I think the Enlightenment is far more of a dominant intellectual force in the world today implicitly than maybe I thought in the past and maybe others have thought in the past. It is there. It is in people's day-to-day -day life just assumed implicitly. Even those who are religious don't take their religion that seriously, not we're near as seriously as they did 500 years ago.
Yeah, they're religious on Sunday. They go to church. And, and some are more religious than that, but mostly it's that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they're pretty egoistic. They care about their paycheck. And they're pretty rational. Again, they can even program. And I think to a large extent, our job, our job is to make those ideas explicit. Our job, Anka Gate has said many times, our job is to save the Enlightenment and to finish, complete its mission. And that's what Ayn Rand does. She gives us the tool to save the Enlightenment. She completes the venture that Locke and, uh, and, and Voltaire and many others in the French and Scottish Enlightenment they set us on a path, and Ayn Rand completes that path. She provides us with the philosophical foundations for individualism and for the efficacy of reason. And reason is man's basic means of survival. Ayn Rand completes that, and our job is to bring that to the forefront, to make this implicit philosophy explicit in people's minds. Now, you know, I've drawn kind of a global picture and again, I don't want to be Pollyannish. There are plenty of people suffering. There are plenty of people whose dreams are shattered because of this regulation or that regulation or, you know, put aside accidents, but of, of, of real problems, real things that are happening out there. But I think at the end of the day, this question of optimism, which I take as a positive view of the future, a positive view of what's possible in the future, I think boils down to what you and I and each one of us does with our own lives and how we view our own future. Can my life be better in the future? Can I live a better life in the future? And at the end of the day, it is that that you have control over. One of the reasons I tell people, stop listening to so much news. Please stop. It's because you have no control over it anyway. I mean, I'm out there speaking constantly about this stuff, and I have no control over it. So yes, you can tweet, and you can Facebook, and you can do all this stuff, but you don't have any control over it. You're not going to change it in dramatic ways soon. And to obsess about it is just silly. And the fears and the threats that everybody is trying to convince you that exists are not real. Muslims are not going to take over the world. It ain't happening because their philosophy is so stupid that, yes, once in a while, they can get their act together and do a 9-11, but for the most part, they're just not competent enough to take us out. It's not going to happen. Immigrants are not going to sweep into this country and drive crime rates into the roof. Crime is down. And with illegal immigration, Crime is even lower than it was before the big push in illegal immigration. It's, crime is not an issue in the United States. Not a issue in terms of, yeah, there's more crime than there should be. But it's not something you should be afraid of. I mean, what are we afraid of? We listen to too much of the negative. And when you hear a constant flow of all the bad news, plastic straws and stuff like that, and it seems like we as human beings like Armageddon stories. We like end-of-the-world stories. It, it excites us. It gets us going, right? Whether it's climate change going to end the world tomorrow or whether it's Y2K or whether it's the thousand other, you know, there's a big resurrection now of overpopulation. You know, Pearl Ehrlich is back. I mean, discredited as it's been, it's not because we constantly... And, it's easy to get sucked into those things. Yes, we dismiss some of them and we engage in others. What you should really be focused on is on your own life, on what you can do to control your future. The robots, for example, are indeed coming and they're after your jobs. No, it's true. So do something about it. Retrain. Think about how you can focus on something that reward cannot do. Take control over your own life. Stand up to whatever challenges the future has and make your life the best that it can be by using your reason, by using, most importantly, Ayn Rand's virtues, the ethics of objectivism. The ethics of objectivism prepares you for a future. 
prepares you to be successful. It is the ethics of success. It is the morality of achievement. So prepare yourself. Yeah, there's going to be lots of bad stuff happening. Tariffs might take away your job, or robots, or immigrants, or whatever. Have a plan. Wow, what a concept. Think about it. Make sure that what you're studying is something that's sustainable. That's something that won't be taken away. And if it is, be prepared to be flexible. This is not science fiction. This is how human beings, at least for the last 250 years, have lived. There's constant change. And you need to adapt to that change. So take your life seriously. Set ambitious goals. Go for it. And take the pride that objectivism teaches us. Take your morality seriously. Be ambitious morally. Seek perfection. Yeah, perfection. Not allowed to talk about that in the world today. Do the best that you can do. Live the best life that you can live. And acknowledge that so that you benefit. The rest of the world might not benefit from the achievements today. You should be benefiting from it. You should be happy. You should reward yourself for the achievements that you have earned because you understand where those achievements come from and why you have earned them and why your life is the standard, not somebody else's, yours. So you are unencumbered by altruism. I mean, that's an exaggeration because altruism is very difficult to get rid of. But if there's anything that you should focus on trying to rid your soul of, trying to rid your mind of, trying to rid every fiber in your body of, it is altruism. Your life does not belong to anybody else but you. Your happiness is your moral ideal. Sacrifice is self-sacrifice. Placing the well-being of others above yourself is evil. It's wrong. Get rid of it. Live for you. I mean, fully understand what that means. Don't be a jerk, right? And be happy as a consequence. And life can get rough. And when life gets rough, and, and again, the news and everything, think about heroes. You know, I think Andy's going to be talking about heroes later in the week. But think about heroes and how inspiring they can be. And think big in terms of heroes. I mean, you could start with, with Howard Rock and John Galt, right? And the challenges in the fountainhead that Rock faces. And think about what that would mean if he was down in the world and down on life and down on everything, right? What would the quarry look like? Would he have turned down the building, you know, the, the, the bank building? What, what would we have done? I mean, the book would be a completely different book. It would, be, it would be not Ayn Rand because Ayn Rand is inherently about you have control over your future and you could make it great and you should be optimistic about that. You should be confident in your future. Or even John Galt, who you'd think is a pessimist, right? The world's gone to hell. No, he's got a solution. He's going to start a Galt's Gulch, and he's going to change the world. He doesn't just sit back and complain. He acts. He's got a plan. He does something to make his life and the people he loves life better. That should inspire. So literary heroes can be great inspirations, but more than that. It's important for us to hold an historical context and look for, for, for heroes in the real world. You know, when you see Antifa shut down a talk, think about Galileo and Newton having to confront a religious authority, not a bunch of kids who don't have a clue with their lives, just thugs who are, I mean, religious authority that could have them killed. Religious authority that didn't want to have anything to do with them. And yet, they persevered and brought us the scientific revolution. Or think of Voltaire and Locke, who brought us the ideas of the Enlightenment but had to escape because they were afraid for their lives because of their ideas. So a bunch of, you know, a bunch of people are writing outside Berkeley. I mean, it's bad, but again, the perspective. Here wasn't a bunch of kids. Here was the authorities. Here it was the king. It was the people in power after you. We're not there yet in America. We can still speak. We can still hold Ocon. So let's put it all in perspective, right? Or think about J.D. Rockefeller bringing light to the world and cheap energy to the world. A kid who had nothing and started from nothing and built something amazing. 
and changed the world in profound ways and had to fight everybody on the way, his competitors, but more importantly, the mudruckers and the politicians and everybody who wanted to destroy his business. And yet he succeeded and he persevered. And you might say, well, that was in the 19th century. Things were free then. Then, okay, think about Steve Jobs, right? Who in this century, or last century, actually, you know, got fired from the company he started that revolutionized computing. Fired from his own company. And then started some strange computer company. I don't know if you ever saw a Next Computer. Pretty cool, but strange. And Pixar, just a little thing. Made some of the best movies of the last 30 years. And then came back to Apple. I mean, and changed the world again. Changed the world again. I mean, he, he believed in himself. He believed in his power. He believed in the power of his vision. And he made it a reality. Well, think about Jeff Bezos, right? <laughs> now, I remember, I remember the late 1990s. I don't know how many of you remember. It was this company selling books online. I was shorting the stock all day long. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Books online? You're going to make money selling books online? And look where we are today. I mean, he's changed our lives. He's the richest man in the world. And think about what he wants to do with his money. I mean, this is so inspiring to me. He's not going to give it away like, Steve jo like Bill Gates. You know what he's going to do with his money? He's going to go to Mars. I mean, you laugh, but he's serious. He is serious. And think about that as a positive. Who 20 years ago among us would think that the privatization of space was something real that could happen? Yeah, it was a dream. It was something maybe one day when we took over the world would happen, but it's happening. Not completely, not fully. But here's Jeff Bezos putting his own capital, competing with others to see who gets to Mars first. I mean, that's cool. That is just cool. So, wow. And then just a few years ago, some kid, I think at one of these conferences, said, I want to build a supersonic jet and make it commercial, right? And it was an Ocon. It's like, yeah, right, <laughs> you're gonna build a supersonic jet. I mean, I'm sure, I don't remember what I thought, but I'm sure that's what I thought. <laughs> and he's doing it. Blake Charles is building a supersonic jet. It's called Boom, look it up online. And it's gonna be commercial. And I'm gonna fly to Asia like that, and to Europe like that, and it's gonna benefit my life directly. He didn't say all the regulators and the, and the philosophy departments and this. He went out and did it. He built it. He created it. Wow. Those are heroes. And those are role models. And those are people that should inspire every, you every single day and every single moment. Because in spite of all the bullshit, in spite of all the crap, in spite of all the ugliness and the bad stuff that happens out there, the world is yours. Go grab it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, on what you said about math reminds me of uh, what I said about I, what math math yeah reminds me of I, I saw The Incredibles last night and uh, Mr. Incredible was struggling to help his son with his new math homework <laughs> and this the movie took place in 1963 and uh, would you say that um, new math is a kind of thing that has been phased out and that we're back on track in terms of I mean, I, yes, I think that's the, the worst parts of that 
it just it so obviously doesn't work that they get scrapped. But is what's replaced it any good? You know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in education. Ask some of the people in education here. But my guess is no, we're still not on the right track. We've just discarded some of the real garbage and the really bad stuff when it's practical, right? So there's still whole language out there. There's still some new math out there. But I'll tell you, I, I went to school in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1974 at what was considered at this time the best school in the in one of the best schools in the United States. Uh, Dukakis's kids went to school with me. Those of you who remember who Dukakis was. Uh, the school had no walls, no desks. We sat on the floor in bean bags, right? And uh, the teachers taught whatever they felt like teaching. My my brother one year they didn't feel like teaching math. Talk about math. So she taught them Russian, right? Instead, and. Um, I think for the most part, that complete nuttiness in schools is gone, although I'm sure there are a few here and there. But that was like the big thing. That was the best school. That was where everything was heading. And we learned nothing for a year. So I think, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be Pollyannish in the sense that everything's great. No, there's a lot of work to do, in, particularly in education. Education sucks in America. It's okay, terrible. That's... Yeah, Lee. Yeah. Um... You talk, talked about the implicit uh, good ideas that drive technology and science. That's obviously true. But there is the other side, which is, uh, I don't know if it's implicit ideas, but leftist statism is going the opposite direction and has been doing so for 200 years. You know, there's, you have a little respite. Actually, Trump has done a few good things. You have to admit a couple of things to reduce the... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they're hesitant, they're afraid. <laughs> you can clap, you can clap. It's okay, I won't eat you. <laughs> but the general trend is still uh, left. If, if, and, uh, with all the technology and all the science, uh, we still have things like the FDA. That's why we don't have life extension, yeah. no, right? is yeah. the FDA. Yeah. And if, if that keeps going, all the technology and the science will not save us from 1984 and then Anthem. It seems to me. So what do you think about that? So I think we have a lot more. So part of my point is I think we have a lot more time. I think you might see some of these innovations that we're talking about happen outside the United States because there are less regulations there, because I think the world is waking up and there are places that are less regulated than the United States. So let's not be so America-focused that we obsess just about what happens here, although that's justified up until now because most innovation happens here. But I think that's going to change in, 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 in our future. Um, I also think that markets, as I said before, if, if, you, if you just looked at regulations of banking coming out of the 1933 34 securities laws, any rational person would have looked at that and said, there's never going to be any banking in the United States. It's finished. There's going to be no innovation in finance. These laws are so horrific. They're so horrendous. And you know what? People found ways around them. It, 90 percent of innovation in the financial industry is to get around regulations. Now, it's not as efficient. It's not as good. It's not a good use of the human mind, but it's better than the alternative, which is succumbing to the regulations. And I suspect that companies will find ways around these things and that there will be progress in spite of it. We're splicing the human gene. I mean, you know more than this than I do, but we're splicing the human, uh, you know, genes. I mean, that's, I don't know where that's going to take us, but that's amazing. And my sense is that people are going to do stuff offline without the FDA, that is, that is maybe going to revolutionize. So, I, I, so let me say this. Long term, yes. You, you have to make the implicit philosophy explicit. Otherwise, right. it will right. die out. I just think the long term is longer, and we are more innovative and flexible and can get around the bullshit than I thought in the past or that I think most objectivists think. I think, and, and this is the evidence. The fact is... You know, and, and uh, that, that we've always thought, oh, it's another five years and then everything will collapse. And the cliff is just in front of us. And it doesn't look like it is. Now, maybe, you know, everything will happen tomorrow. And I was all wrong. But I don't think so. I don't see it. Um, and I don't think Ayn Rand saw it like that, right? I, I think she had a much, uh, she believed in America. In 1980, think about 1980. She did this interview where she said she, she still believed in America and she thought the future was good and everything like that. And think about what was going on in the 1980s compared to today, right? Um, American hostages were being held in Tehran, 50 of them, and America was doing nothing to save them, right? Uh, we had very high inflation and very high unemployment, stagflation. 
crime rates were way higher than they are today. Way higher. You couldn't walk in Central Park. In daytime, you couldn't walk in Central Park in 1980. And they got worse over the next decade, and then they declined dramatically since then. So, and yet, I think, I think in many respects, the world was much worse in 1980. And yet, she was still held the idea that good ideas will win out in this implicit philosophy that is embedded in, in much of modern life will survive long enough for those of us who want to make it explicit to win out. Just let me add one, one quick thing to this. And, uh, you know, Steven Pinker is a great advocate of what you're yep. talking about. Yep. But what he misses because he's a leftist is he, he has shown that violence has decreased yep. over the centuries. But, not, but what he hasn't shown about force, yep. the gov governmental force has not decreased. And the, the leftists don't, you know, the, the leftists from the Berkeley times don't make that, sure. Uh, sure. don't understand that violence and force are the same, well, same problem. They don't understand that. And I, force is still, governmental force is still on the increase, and we need those explicit ideas to, to reverse that. To reverse that, no yeah. question. But look, first let me say, I strongly recommend Steven Pinker's latest book, Enlightenment Now. I, I, I think everybody should read it. It's not all good. There were a lot of bad stuff in it. But the good stuff is so good that you should read it. Everybody should read it. Uh, I also think he's got deep philosophical problems beyond the leftists, which are reflected in other books. They come out in this book as well. But you're all going to catch that. Focus in on the good stuff. There's a lot of good material in the book that will make your life better. But I would say that's true. But on the other hand, I'd rather live in a society, and this may be <laughs> just me, where people are not murdering and raping and pillaging and there's regulation. So I'd like both to go away, but the, the threat to my actual life of being mugged and robbed or, or slaughtered in Central Park in, in daylight, I'd, I'd rather that go away. And yes, I would like all of the force go away, but, but I think that violence probably has to go first. We have to live in a society in which we value human life so much that we're not willing to be explicitly violent. And I think, again, implicitly, that hopefully, and we will help it through explicit philosophy, transition into the idea, okay, well, if that's wrong, then other forms of force are wrong as well. That's my optimistic view of that. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, over the last several years, I've had opportunities to talk to numerous startup founders and business leaders, and almost universally, they believe they're doing really great work. They know that they're thriving in their life. They know that their company might be doing well. And then almost universally, they believe some significant part of the world is getting worse always. Yeah. And it, they may not even believe that they have to do something about it. They may not be approaching it from altruism, but just in terms of their view of the world, there seems to be this significant difference between how they see the advancement of their own life and how the rest of the world is progressing. Yes, I think that's, that's generally true of, of people out there, right? So we all think our life's pretty good. You know, people ask, people do these surveys, and they ask people, what do you think about your health insurance? Oh, my health insurance is great. My health insurance, what do you think about, you know, health insurance generally? Oh, it's awful. The health insurance everybody else has is terrible. We need socialized medicine, even though mine is fine. Every, so people have this perspective on their own life, but they listen to the news, <laughs> and they read newspapers, right? And they get the constant flood of, no, life sucks, and it's terrible, and it's awful, and it's violent. My neighborhood's safe, but I, there are neighborhoods out there that are incredibly violent because there's violence. I hear it on the news every single day. It must be everywhere. It's just not with me. So I think people have that perspective because they, first of all, there's no positive news being broadcast. We don't hear about the positives. The positives we know about our own lives because we experience them. But we can't generalize. I guess people don't generalize. They don't think. Um, so yes, there's generally an optimism about your own life and a pessimism about the world that pervades particularly the startup community. Yeah. Is there anything about that that can be done to, I mean, is that an idea that people hold that needs to change? Or is it just the news? Well, they need to think, and they need to be objective. And they're not being objective. That is, they're not assessing facts objectively the, the, they're looking at it from a very narrow subjective, it's a subjectivist approach. The, it's, it's, it's completely a subjective view of it. I, you know, there's probably a deeper answer, but that's the best I have right now. Yeah. 
Yes, what do you think of uh, the current theocratic control and theocratic prohibitions and medical research so that it is illegal in the United States to do medical research without the approval of so-called ethicists, all of whom are religious figures. It's a system created by Leon Cass, uh, who is an explicit opponent of life extension. Yep. And now we have something that would have given the cardinals who imprisoned Galileo a wet dream about power because now the theocrats have total power over medical research in the United States and in most of the world. Well, I mean, I think, I think the, the tragedy here is that this is something that both the left and the right agree on. So the Leon Cassis of the world, who's from the right, who was, who was Bush's appointee to the Biotech Commission, uh, I forget it was in the, uh, in the 2000s, and came out with a scathing report about how life extension was bad. You know why life extension is bad? It'll bankrupt Social Security. No, but even worse than Social Security, well, why is life extension bad? It's going to cause massive numbers of divorce. I mean, you can live with a woman for 50 years. <laughs> but 100? Give me a break. I'd live with you 100. Um, <laughs> but that was in the report. This is a scientific report about the evil of life extension. And he's worried about divorce. Who the f cares. <laughs> I want to live to be 200. You're worried about me getting divorced? I can't think of anything more evil than that. So yes, Adam, I, I agree. I, and I hope, my hope is that while we are descending into this nuttiness, insanity, that there are going to be places in the world that won't do that. There are people doing uh, gene therapy studies elsewhere in the world that are not allowed to be done in the United States. And I think, you know, so I'm a patriot. I love America. I, I, I love the idea of America. I love the founding. I, I moved here because this was the place I wanted to live. I love everything about this country. But you know what? If, if this country becomes nuts as it, it, is, it, is, it is becoming, then there are other places in the world to live. Now, I'm on the border now, right? Because I live in Puerto Rico, which is a leg in and a leg out, right? And there's a reason for that, because it's crazy here. And so I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that I think the, 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 the striving towards the betterment of life will revive somewhere else, even if it dies some, to some extent here. There will be somewhere else where they'll allow this research and it'll keep going. And I encourage those of you in the science to look for other places that have better regulatory regimes where you can do this, where you, where you can do the kind of science that is going to extend human life. Because given the state of science, there's no reason, I think, that we couldn't live dramatically longer lives than what we, again, Lee would know more about this and Adam would know a bit more about this, but it strikes me from the little I know and from the people I've talked to that we could be living much, much longer, healthy lives than we do today. And what really is the barrier to that is the FDA. And, but I think those scientific breakthroughs are going to happen somewhere. And we are going to, well, at least the young people in this audience are going to benefit. Again, the real tragedy, I mean, again, I, I mentioned two tragedies of the world in which we live in today. It's what could be. We could already have those technologies, if not for the FDA, and not for the regulatory state and, 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 and everything else. We could already have it. We could already be living there. And what it does to individual human beings, the fact that they live with altruism. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it's the parallel universe. It makes our job, by the way, much more difficult to convince people that there, that there could be a parallel universe in which we're all living much better, happier, more prosperous lives than we do. It's hard enough to show them Venezuela, right? A real concrete example of the evil of socialism. Never mind, oh, but there's this potential. You have to have an imagination to see the potential. Hi. Yaron, you travel all over the world. You speak to young people everywhere. And, of course, we, we owe you big time for it. Uh, 
in, in terms of being optimistic, uh, what do you think, uh, where is the objectivist movement in, say, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Or if, if, if you don't know, or just off the top of your head, where, you see, where do you see yourself in 10, oh, 15 geez. years? I, I would really like to know. South of Spain on the beach. Um, <laughs> I mean, so I'll give you a few observations. Uh, one, the objectivist movement is becoming a global movement, uh, whereas I think it was almost predominantly an American movement, and those of us who wanted to participate came here. So I immigrated here, Tal's an immigrant here, uh, Leonard Peikoff's an immigrant here, obviously Ayn Rand is an immigrant to the United States. I think it's becoming a global movement where a lot of people will not immigrate here, they will stay in their countries, but because those countries are getting better, and, uh, and the, the difference between America and the rest of the world is shrinking, not because, because they're getting better, but also because we're getting less good, uh, unfortunately. But, so I think it's a global movement. If you look at Ayn Rand book sales right now, book sales out of the United States has almost reached the same level as book sales in the United States, which is amazing because <laughs> book sales out of the United States used to be close to zero. They used to be negligible up until just a few years, uh, maybe a decade ago. Um, so I think, I think one answer is it's, it's, it's global. I think it's substantially bigger, and you, you're starting to see it with Ocon growing, and, and I think it could grow a lot more. I think it's much more embedded into the culture in terms of an explicit alternative that people are discussing and debating. Uh, I, I think this so-called intellectual dark web is a positive phenomena because I think what you're seeing among them is um, intellectuals who are not, strike you at least, as honest, not power lusting. They're wrong. <laughs> They're wrong, let's be clear. But, but they don't have that same nihilistic you know, ugliness that so many of, of intellectuals, both on the left and the right, have had in the past. There's a sudden interest in debate and discussion and, and the truth, at least I hope so. And I think it's an opportunity for us to be injecting our ideas much more significantly into the culture. Uh, it's why, you know, I, I think it's a positive move to have uh, a dis conversation here with Jordan Peterson tomorrow. I think that's a positive direction because we get to expose people to our ideas in ways that we couldn't in the past. Um, so I, I, I'm optimistic about our ability to continue to get our ideas out there and, and to start. And look, I see so many signs. And I, I didn't say this in the talk, but I should have. I believe Ayn Rand has had a massive impact on the culture. I believe one of the reasons the Enlightenment is still around is because of Ayn Rand. And I'll give you just a few quick examples. In the 1950s, 60s, capitalism was a dirty word. What made capitalism a more positive word by the time we get into the 80s was Ayn Rand and maybe some Milton Friedman. But they're the ones who popularized the term capitalism and made it cool again. And I don't know that Ronald Reagan gets elected if not for Ayn Rand. I really don't. Millions of people read Atlas Shrugged. They didn't become objectivists, but it made them a little bit better. It made them just a little bit more reality-oriented. It made them just a little bit more sympathetic to markets and capitalism, more skeptical of government. And I think Reagan won and Thatcher won maybe because of those elements. Can't prove it. We know that the draft was eliminated in the United States partially because of Ayn Rand's influence over the people who were on the commission to eliminate the draft, to, to evaluate the draft. But more than that, you find me a startup in Silicon Valley, and I know you know, somebody's going to give me a whole list of them, but find me a startup in Silicon Valley where the CEO hasn't at least read the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged. Again, not become, not become an objectivist. They don't. But think about what Atlas Shrugged does even if you don't become an objectivist. It gives you more courage. It inspires you. And they all say this, if, if, you know, in private when they don't have to. But <laughs> whether it's the founder of Uber or the founder of Oracle, Larry Ellison, or, or, or the founder of Sun, Sam McNeely, or, the, or it turns out Steve Jobs. Who knew? But according to Wozniak, Steve Jobs was inspired by Atlas Shrugged. Or Michael Dell, who was reading Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged as he was assembling his first computers in his dorm room in Austin, Texas. Or, you know, my guess is almost all of them. And then go to the Fortune 500 companies. Certainly 10 years ago, maybe still today, 
as they become more and more crony, I think this number comes down. But how many of them read Atlas Shrugged? Well, like a large number. A large number of successful CEOs read it, and it inspired them. And they think it's a great book. They didn't become objectivists. But it's a step. It's a move. It's all going in the right direction because they are keeping the world going. They're inspiring their companies. They are bringing their reality orientation to their businesses, even if they don't know that that comes from this philosophy. Ayn Rand reinforced all that. So she's already in the culture, everywhere, everywhere. And, you know, I was talking to Lars yesterday. He's going to be talking later today. And he said, you know, all these, all, he's, he, he bought, are you going to tell the story? Yeah, he bought 20,000 copies of Atlas Shrugged years ago in 2002 or something like that. Uh, and he, he actually wrote his own little intro to it, and it was great. And he, he took these and he put the, uh, the Saxo Bank logo on every one of these, uh, and he distributed them to the leading business people and some politicians and intellectuals in Europe. And to this day, he gets notes from people who, who read the book and how wonderful and how it changed their life and how it inspired them and made them a little bit better, not turned them into objectivists. It's not going to happen. The number of people who become objectivists is always going to be small. It's the fact that we change the way people think about the world in subtle, implicit ways, and they are better, and the people around them are better, and their companies are better, and the world is better. So Rand has already had a profound impact on businessmen in Europe because of the work laws has done, on businessmen and students in the U.S. because of what John Allison has done, of what the Institute has done, of what all of you do when you go out there into the world and talk to people and recommend that they read Alice Shrugged and, 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 and just live a good life so people see you living a good life and want to emulate you. So I see that just continuing and, and, and it compounds, you know, compound interest. So just like Moore's Law with, uh, where it becomes exponential, right? And, and computing power just goes like this, which is part of that optimism story. Uh, well, maybe there's a Moore's law to objectivism, right? We're still, we're still here. We're still going like this, right? We still can't see the little differences. But there's an inflection point at some point where it goes in exponential. Now, is that going to happen in 10, 15 years? Probably not. But it's moving in the right direction. It's growing in influence. More people are exposed. More of you are living out there and talking about these ideas. And so... More, better. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Book. My question is on Bill Gates. Ankar gave a talk at the Better Society at some meeting saying, Bill Gates said, I want to put a PC on every desk in the planet. And then today, billions of people have that. My question is on the motive. As you, as you just said, Mr. Lawrence bought 20,000 copies, stamped the logo on, and did it, I imagine, because he loves this world and existence. But do you think the motive could also be the alternative altruism? Because my theory is after the Justice Department did what, he, did what they did to Gates, it broke his heart, and he adopted the philosophy of if you can't beat enjoyment, he basically went the Krugman route. But this was before that. This was when he was with Microsoft and he loved yeah. his work. Yeah, so I can't, I can't get into Bill Gates' head. So I can just tell you what I see when I see him and what I think. I think Bill Gates loves life. And he enjoys, he loved Microsoft. Loved Microsoft and loved what he was doing at Microsoft. It was a challenge. It was fun. It, it had a vision. He was going to change the world. And he did. He changed the world in profound, deep ways that, that I, I think historians will have to look back and see the extent to which having a desktop in every home changed the world. Um, but I think he also is, because he's so smart, he's very connected to the explicit ideas that are out there. So he struggles, I think, between his sense of life, his, his passion for living, his love of technology, his love of life, and the fact that he thinks he should feel guilty for all of that. I don't know that he feels guilty. I think he thinks he needs to feel guilty. I think he, I think he thinks that to be moral, he should feel guilty. And so he does things that he thinks a guilty person would do. Like say it was all luck. Does he really believe that? Does he really believe that? I mean, I think he thinks he believes that, right? 
or like starting a philanthropy and abandoning, leaving Microsoft completely. And, you know, I watched him on television, and you can see when he talks about his investments, when he talks about technology, he lights up. He's so excited. He loves this stuff. He talks about philanthropy. You know, he's okay. He's not miserable, but it's not the same thing. But he's not, he doesn't have enough, you know, good philosophy to be able to abandon that and go with what he really loves and what is really good, right? So I think, and, and you can see he's very intellectual. He reads a lot, and he reads all this stuff. So he's read John Rawls, and he's read all the modern philosophy, and he he, he, he's accepted it. He's absorbed it. It, it. it doesn't go on deep, but at some level, he's accepted it, and he's accepted that he should feel guilty at some point. And that's the tragedy. That's the real tragedy, right? That's the tragedy I talked about. The one tragedy is we don't have the world we could have. The other tragedy is what it does to the individual soul. What could be more tragic, should bring tears to your eyes, than a giant like Bill Gates thinking he should feel guilty? I mean, that's depressing just to think that, right? So, you know, and he's read Ayn Rand, so, I, you know, he's been offered the alternative and he's rejected it from what I can tell. Right? Thank you. Yep. Hello. Hey. Um, so you mentioned uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Jeff Bezos, and now I heard your thoughts on um, Bill Gates as well. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering... Uh, and this is probably inevitable, but uh, what are your thoughts on Elon Musk? Is he, so recently he's been kind of decreeing the media, uh, saying they're, they're saying all these terrible things about me. Uh, so is he closer to sort of the Rorkian hero, uh, like, uh, like an industrialist, or is he closer to just a really convincing Robert movie? Stadler? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Look, Elon Musk is, is a contradiction because he is not, he's certainly not a hard work. Um, he, he, but, he, but he's also not a, um, a, a James Taggart, right? Um, he, he, first of all, he's brilliant. I mean, the guy, for people who know him and from what I've heard and from what I see, the guy's brilliant. I mean, he really is brilliant. Um, and he, he is a problem solver and he knows how to solve problems. But he's also a crony, a complete and utter crony who, who lives from the government, from government projects, from government money, from government financing. He builds a, 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 a car that, you know, uh, only certain people can afford, and yet all of us are subsidizing, particularly if you live in California, heavily, heavily subsidizing, right? Um, and runs on coal, as Alex Epstein likes to say, right? a coal car. Um, <laughs> And he pretends he's virtuous because he's done this, right? Now, again, some of the science on the technology is amazing, but it's amazing as a luxury car for a few people who, who think it's really cool to drive a, a... It's not something we... We shouldn't be subsidizing anything, but certainly not subsidizing something like this. Uh, his solar panel thing, same thing, right? All about subsidies and all about government incentives and all about working with the government. So he's this... Genius who sold his soul to the state, to the collective, to, you know, and this is how he makes his money, by exploiting that. And he's still applying his genius in some ways, but it's so tied up that I, I really have no respect for him. I mean, I respect his genius, but I, I, I disrespect him as a human being. All right, thank you. Okay, um, I have a two-part question, but I think right, we don't have much related, time. So maybe you can bundle the answer together. Yeah. All right. So the first part of the question is, um, how do you think government subsidization into the private sector distorts the implicit philosophy that you described earlier? And the second question is, what do you think the implicit philosophy at work is uh, in people that work for uh, illegitimate sectors of the government, like the IRS? <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay, so what do I think? They, well, I think it distorts it and weakens it and, and, and it disrupts it. So when reality is not your judge, but how much money you're going to get from the government, like in like Elon Musk, like Tesla, then that reality gets distorted. And I, I don't think it's an accident that Tesla's having a lot of problems right now because it hasn't been, it hasn't been required to live up to the marketplace. It's been shielded from the marketplace, and now... You know, it's, it, it has to face the reality 
that, you know, he's, he's missed all these deadlines and there's a good chance they go on them because they're going to have to raise capital. And I'm not sure the capital is there, right? People have lost. So it ultimately leads to failure. I think subsidies lead to failure. I think subsidized industries. But it changes your whole orientation. Instead of focused on reality, you're focused on politics. You're focused on schmoozing. You're focused on lobbying. This is, you know. So one of the phenomena that you see is that the type of CEO who rises to the top at large publicly traded companies today are not CEOs who are driven by a business mentality. Right? I think business mentality, I think Jack Welsh at GE in the 1980s. And then when I think political mentality, I think of Jeff Immelt at GE since then. Jeff Immelt is a politician, a schmoozer, a get-along, subsidy-seeking bad guy. Right. And he destroyed GE. He destroyed GE. The G company's gone. G you know, uh, oh, I forget his name now. Um, the guy with uh, GE that I mentioned a minute ago. Welsh, I mean, built an amazing company. And ML destroyed it. That's what subsidies do. That's what, and the problem is that the subsidies also cause the wrong people to become CEOs. So when the board had to decide, but when replacing Jack Welsh, replacing with another Jack Welsh, a, a, a productive genius, somebody focused on making money, versus a politician, they chose the politician because they knew the world was changing. So the whole orientation of business changes and it diminishes that implicit philosophy that's built into business. This is one of, this is why I think if you, if you think about uh, role models, if you think about heroes, if you think about great businessmen today, they're primarily in tech because it's not regulated or not as regulated. It's still regulated. It's not as regulated, right? So, so there they can still rise up on that basis. Okay, okay last question. Make it quick. Otherwise, Anu is going to come out. So, good morning and thank you. I'm really, really happy that you are more optimistic. <laughs> I think about 10 years ago, you said that you, there was a whole idea about going to Estonia or forming something and then New Hampshire and all of that. There was a, there's a, there's a, a friend of mine who's actually a contributor to the Institute, very, very wealthy individual, um, who about 10 years ago, and I think I told you this story, yeah. um, who said, you know, let's buy Estonia. <laughs> It was like, there's one and a half million people there. How much could it cost? <laughs> like, and when I told him I'm moving to Puerto Rico, he said, huh. Um, those Puerto Rican bonds, they're really cheap. What if I bought them all up and forced them to, impo to put you as governor? Oh. I said, cool, let's do it, right? Is that why the He's a character, a great guy, and, and, but yes, that's how, that's how he thinks, so. I would have never thought of buying Estonia. It's, you know, not in my wealth uh, scope. But yeah. you are more optimistic. What changed? Like, what did you, what facts did you learn? Did you change your mental way of integrating it? What changed about it? I mean, maybe I'm more optimistic. I, I don't know if I'm more optimistic than I was 10 years ago. Uh, you, you think I am, all right. Um, yeah, if you listen to my podcast, I don't come across as that optimistic, so I don't know. I really think it's, it's, um, it's expecting doom and gloom and it not happening, um, expecting the financial crisis to be much worse than it was, seeing the phenomenal advancements that technology has made over the last 10, 20 years, and, and seemingly unstoppable, reading a little bit about kind of Moore's Law and the potential for Moore's Law and other areas in technology. Uh, I think Arturo Gamboa gave me a, 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 a book called Abundance at some point, which was inspiring about what, what is possible. To, now, I think it's a little too much, but, but the trend and, and what's going on. And just living another 10 years and, hey, it looks good. <laughs> and, um, and starting to think about why is it, right? It, it shouldn't be. Right? If, 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 uh, at least my superficial rationalistic view, and, and granted this is a wrong view, of yeah, it shouldn't, you know, look at all the bad stuff and why is there good stuff? Why can, how does the good stuff live with the bad stuff? So I think it's a combination of those things. <laughs> Maybe because I'm not CEO of the Ironman Institute anymore. Uh, <laughs> Tal starts out optimistic. Um, I don't know, it's just, it's just looking at the world, thinking about it more, engaging with it more, 
and, and seeing what's out there. And I do think seeing what we've done over the last 20 years and where objectivism has gone in 20 years and real, starting to realize the ways in which Ayn Rand has affected the world, I think it inspires me. And maybe, and part, you know what part of it is? And I've said this before, it's, it's going global. It's, it's going to other countries and seeing. You know, okay, I'll end with this, right? In 2004, uh, my wife and I went to China. And, uh, you know, I, I had the typical objectivist view of China. It's a bubble. There's nothing there because they're too authoritarian. There can't be any real progress. It's all pretend. It's all fictitious. And I remember I, w I was going to go. We were, we were going to Thailand, and a friend of mine said, you should go to Shanghai. I said, who has time for Shanghai? I've got to be at this other place. I'm giving a lecture in Dongguan, and I, I don't want to go to Shanghai. He said, no, no, no. You've got to go to Shanghai. I said, okay, go to Shanghai. So I went for literally for 24 hours. I flew in and flew out, right? And we're driving in to Shanghai. And I got goosebumps. I get goosebumps now thinking about it. I mean, it was unbelievable what I saw. And I don't know how many of you have been to Shanghai, but it's, it, it, and it's, it's even more so today than it was in 2004. The skyscrapers, the lights, the billboards. The first thought that went through my mind is, there's not a single communist here. You can't have communism and billboards the size of Times Square, Times Square small as compared to what they have there, right? And suddenly, and then, and then from there we went to Dongguan, and I thought, Dongguan, what's Dongguan? It's nothing, right? Dongguan was a city of 8 million people that 20 years did, uh, before did not exist. It was a city in which 50% of all the shoes were manufactured in the world. It's a city that had a huge tech sector. It's a city in which not a single human being sat down because they were so busy. They, they, people were busy moving sk skyscrapers, cranes. It, they took my wife on a tour of the largest mall, shopping mall in the world. Uh, with one side, there was the Venetian misspelled, so they wouldn't have to pay royalties to the Venetian. <laughs> I mean, but literally, it looked exactly like the Venetian from Las Vegas. I mean, this grandeur, and I'm going, I have this strange feeling that history, history happened here, and we missed it. Something happened here that was huge. And I was thinking, in 100 years, nobody will care if George Bush or Kerry won the election. But what happened in China in the 1990s and 2000s is profound. It freed up. Not completely. They're far from free. But it freed up 1.4 billion people. It gave productive energy and productive sanction to hundreds of millions of Chinese. And they did something with it. They created something with it. And it wasn't because objectivism appeared in China. It was because they adopted some good ideas that they emulated from America and from Japan. And again, this capitalism reinforces those ideas. Business, work, reinforces those ideas. And they, you know, and, 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 and they were passionate about their own lives. They, these were not, uh, c you know, altruistic collectivist sacrifices for the, for, for the Chinese state. These were individuals trying to make their lives the best lives that they thought they could make. And they felt less guilty than Americans did. And it was exciting. And I think as I've gone through the world and seen more of that, and seeing the changes. I mean, the Berlin Wall fell. Wow! <laughs> right? In 1980, when Ayn Rand was relatively optimistic, right? The Berlin Wall was still up. Communism was everywhere. It controlled about a third of the world, or maybe two-thirds of the world, if you count China and the population. And, and, and she was still... And now, communism's gone. I mean, these kids who think they're communists, they don't know what communism... You know... Anu's there. <laughs> you know why they call themselves social democrats? Because there are no socialists. The number of socialists, real socialists, the state owning the means of production, the proletarian, the, 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 the dictator of the, you know, the, the dictatorship of the proletarian, they, they, they exist, but there are very few of them. So what they want is social democracy. What's social democracy? Is we want, we understand that capitalism produces the goods, and then we want to capture them and redistribute them. I mean, that's awful, evil, bad, horrible. But it sure beats communism. And it sure beats real socialists. Right? At least they recognize now, as Marx did, I think, but many of his followers didn't, that capitalism produces the goods. 
and we can leverage that and we can take advantage of that and we can expand that. So uh, I'll end with this. Our opposition, the left, on the right, they have nothing. They have nothing. I mean, post nihilism is nothing. Socialism is ridiculous. And there are no ideologues on the other side. There's no ideology on the other side. I mean, religion maybe, but there's no other ideology to oppose us. We're it. The rest are pragmatists of various forms. More altruistic, less altruistic, but all pragmatists. There's no systematic ideology in the world today in opposition. So the world's ours. Go get it. Sorry to break this off, but if you are going to the lunch now, I gave you a wrong room earlier. It's going to be in Newport Coast next door. Thank you. <laughs>